a little bit like off the beginning and the end and so forth, but. Okay, so, all right, welcome to an interview with Professor Patrick Deneen of Notre Dame University. And he is going to talk to us about his book and the concepts therein, Why Liberalism Failed. So Professor, first, if you can start us off with a little bit of your background and your academics and uh, what you currently are teaching at Notre Dame. Sure. Um, well, I, uh, I, I hail from the uh, uh, original colonies, uh, uh, state of Connecticut, outside of Hartford, Connecticut. Grew up in a um, small town, Windsor, Connecticut, uh, kind of the kind of town that uh, Alexis de Tocqueville was writing about when he praised the New England township. It was you know, framed around the idea of the town green and a kind of public space at the center of the town uh, around which were flanked uh, churches and uh, town hall and community uh, buildings. So I grew up in some ways educated uh, to, uh, by the, in some ways the, the architecture and the history of, of my town. And uh, it took me a long time to philosophically realize that the reasons I liked it actually had a kind of philosophical basis. Um, it probably wasn't until I read Alexis de Tocqueville that I realized, wow, this is why I like my hometown. Um, I uh, went off to college uh, at Rutgers University, um, did a degree in English, uh, spent uh, a bit of time at University of Chicago in the Committee on Social Thought, and then returned to Rutgers to finish uh, my PhD in political science, political philosophy under the tutelage of Wilson Carey McWilliams, one of the great sort of communitarian thinkers uh, of the last century. Uh, and uh, then went on to hold uh, academic positions at Princeton, uh, Georgetown University, and uh, currently at the University of Notre Dame. All right, thanks so much. All right, so the first question, I'm gonna break right into this, and I'm going to uh, let people see this part so they can kind of get an idea of where the question, the generality of the question. Uh, so I, you know, I did not want to be pedestrian and just ask you to define what you meant by liberalism. Instead, please explain why you say in your book that conservative liberals and progressive liberals always succeed in achieving their liberal goals, their, their liberal goals, but fail at achieving goals that the members of the American Solidarity Party, for example, would actually like politicians to work towards. So uh, you, I think you frame this question to uh, allow me to avoid the, the ticklish question of what is liberalism, uh, which I'm always asked, but I think there's no way to really tackle this question <laughs> right. without at least touching on that. Um, and of course, it's a debated term. It's one of those terms like justice or, um, uh, or of course, liberty that, uh, uh, that people debate about what it, what it means exactly. Um, but uh, my, own, my own definition is that liberalism is a particular way of understanding and defining uh, the word and concept of liberty, of course, that's the root of the word uh, liberal is liberty. Uh, it's, liberty is a very old word uh, and a very ancient word. It goes back all the way to ancient Rome and has its Greek predecessors. Um, in, its, in its earliest form, let's say in the classical and certainly Christian understanding, liberty was a condition in which we achieved a kind of self-governance, right? So when Paul uh, talks about, uh, St. Paul talks about people being enslaved, uh, uh, to their passions or, or enslaved by sin. This means um, uh, that people are not governing themselves well. Whereas he says when they are free, when they find freedom in Christ, they've actually achieved a kind of transcendence over and a command over uh, the, their sinful proclivities, or at least to the extent that's possible. Liberalism is, you could say, is, it appropriates, takes the language of liberty and redefines it. And it redefines it uh, to mean really freedom from constraint or freedom from obstacles that allow us to pursue the things that we want. So in a really kind of magical uh, sort of appropriation, it redefines a word and a concept to mean exactly the opposite of what it used to mean. Um, and so liberalism is really, uh, it really advances the idea that to be free is to be free of other people, to be free of circumstance, to be free of place, to be free of any commitment or any circumstance that you haven't freely chosen, that you haven't, um, uh, that hasn't been in some ways, not just doesn't, uh, doesn't merely give rise to a condition of freedom from others, but the context in which you make that, that choice is itself free from any kind of constraint or limitation. So when we talk about liberalism, uh, and often today when we talk about divide between the left and the right, 
what we're really talking about is a debate within this frame of liberalism. In other words, the American, the typical American left and the typical American right, when you think of what we call liberal and conservative or progressive and conservative, are, is actually a debate within this liberal frame. It's not a debate outside of the liberal frame. And the, and the debate really is, what is the best means of achieving this condition of freedom from any constraint upon my choice? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, the, the classical liberal tradition, uh, what we call conservative in this country, has argued that the best means or the best venue for that um, uh, achievement of freedom is through the free exercise of choices in the marketplace. That we enter the marketplace as, in some ways, free radicals, right? Uh, as a consumer, you're not constrained or you ought not to be constrained by any limitation on your choice other than, of course, illegality. Uh, and we should be able to choose what it is we want. In other words, the argument is that the free market should not constrain the freedom to make our choices as consumers. Right? We shouldn't be told what product we, we should prefer, or we shouldn't be told what school we prefer in the example of school. So everything can be subject to this kind of market choice. And of course, progressive liberals argue that this, this um, idea of the market being the, the place of freedom actually uh, masks or shrouds how it results in kind of radical kind of inequality, uh, that not everyone is able to choose in conditions of equal freedom. And the consequences of the choices in the marketplace actually results in extreme material inequality that, that we see around us in the world today. So progressive liberals have argued that to achieve the condition of the free human self, we need uh, often extensive government intervention uh, in the form especially of programs that allow us to be the creatures that can make the free choices unconstrained uh, by circumstance. And the way in particular that this has come to be emphasized, especially, is the freedom that we need in the sort of social sphere. So in the progressive uh, liberal worldview, the greatest constraints uh, that we face are the constraints upon our free choice that come from more of the private realm, I think, or the social realm. Constraints upon us from family circumstance, from historical circumstance, uh, and increasingly from gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, and so forth. And so the aim becomes to break down any constraints upon, you could say, increasingly ident forms of identi identity and identification. Uh, that foster or that might prevent um, the realization of ourselves as as um, uh, freely choosing selves. So the, the debate the debate really comes down to a divide between what is the best means of achieving this condition of the truly free, autonomous, liberated human self, the self-making self. That is some ways the ideal of the liberal vision. And today's, or at least until recently, the left and the right have been arguments over means rather than ends. All right, thank you. That's quite an answer. Uh, and you actually did answer another question of mine. And but I do want to read this quote from your book, regardless, uh, even though you did answer it very well. It, it, in the book, you say this is something I had to read a couple times uh, to, to, to digest, and then I realized that it's exactly my thoughts on this situation. But I couldn't have written it this way. So you say that the achievement of liberalism was not simply a wholesale rejection of its precedents but in many cases attained its ends by redefining shared words and concepts, and through that redefinition, colonizing existing institutions with fundamentally different anthropological assumptions. And I, and I think you really broke that down very well, talking about how liberty, you know, you, when it went from St. Paul to what we're talking about now. Um, and, and I think that idea of colonizing existing institutions, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's not like it's like you flip a switch or you have an ideological war that's out there in the open. It's you slowly, subversively, you know, I don't know, uh, from the inside take over with, with just changing the definition of words over time. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, yeah. I think that's, I think it's important to stress that uh, um, often, you know, people who are trying to think outside of the liberal frame, uh, sometimes they're called post liberals or there's various terms nowadays floating around. They're often accused of being authoritarians or uh, uh, haters of freedom. And really, I think what, what is really at issue is um, a con contesting understanding of what actually liberal, liberty is, what actually is the condition of freedom and liberty. And I would say that among the people that I certainly know who are in this kind of um, 
um, who are in this effort to uh, attempt to, to move us beyond the liberal frame, uh, they're, they're informed by these pre-modern or pre-liberal understandings of the word and concept of liberty. Yeah, I, I think it was uh, uh, Father Benedict Rochelle. I saw him uh, giving a really short reflection on EWTN one time, and he talked about, he, he just asked the question, are you free to play chess? And I'm not sure if you've seen that, but uh, he just had a good idea of saying, you know, people look at that and they think of, well, no one's stopping me from playing chess. And it's an external concept of freedom. But then he points out, he goes, well, if you don't know the rules of chess and you haven't practiced the skills of chess, then you really aren't free to play chess from within. You know, it doesn't matter if someone lets you, puts a chess board in front of you, puts chess pieces in front of you. And I think that addresses what you were saying about that older idea of self-governance, like, you know, um, so I, I, again, great thoughts on that. And uh, I'm gonna move to the next topic. And, and uh, so this, this next one kind of, it still continues. And your book was pretty seamless with the continuation of where you started uh, your, your, your thesis. And so the question is, uh, the American Solidarity Party puts the common good first in our motto. Please elaborate on how Machiavelli sought to replace the classical slash Christian aspiration for higher ideals and replace them with a look at baser instincts and the effects that remain of that idea in our policy today. Yeah, so we're going to be have a political theory uh, seminar, it seems. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, not to, not to get too deep into the weeds here. Um, but uh, the, the, let's, I mean, let's take first the idea of a common good. What is common good? And it's actually, it's, it's funny, um, maybe not funny, but I often ask uh, my students at, at the University of Notre Dame, what is the common good? And the answer that they will give me, in spite of the fact that probably many of them went to Catholic schools and should, at least in theory, have a, have a basic understanding of Catholic social teaching, many of them give me the answer, the common good is what the most people think is good. And that's actually, in some ways, the opposite, or at least certainly an insufficient understanding of what the common good is. In other words, that's an understanding that comes from, you could say, American electoral politics or uh, from the idea of the market, um, that the market is the aggregation of individual choices. And that's, that's what we think of as the common good. And that's the default that we usually think of. But that's, in fact, not uh, certainly the Thomistic or the Aristotelian and the classical understanding of the common good. The Thomistic and classical understanding of the common good is that there is a good, right? There is, objectively speaking, a good, in this case, there's a good for human beings. There is a, there's a, um, in Aristotelian terms, there's a telos, or an end, or a kind of finality, or let's say a, um, a completion that, if achieved, um, uh, results in the human being achieving a, a condition of happiness, right? So for, for Aristotle, uh, the telos of human life is to achieve, to achieve the condition of happiness. And happiness isn't a subjective condition. It's not a subjective feeling by Aristotle's understanding. It's not whether I'm feeling happy today or sad today. It's whether, in some ways, I've achieved in the fullness of the possibility of what it is to be a human being, whether I've been able to achieve that condition. And, and this is a condition that Aristotle argued is, is shared impossible to be shared by all human beings. Therefore, it is common. It is something that we can all share. It is a condition that is true to all human beings. So it's not something that's merely your form of happiness or her or his form of happiness. It's rather an objective state or an objective condition. Now, having laid that out, of course, there's a lot of debate over what that is. And Aristotle himself recognizes there's dispute over what this common good is. But you could say in regimes or in political orders, that accept this understanding that there is a common good. The discussion will be, what is the common good? How do we best understand that? Uh, and how do we arrange our institutions uh, as best to make possible that as many people as possible living in our political regime are able to achieve this condition uh, of fulfillment of the telos of their end? So in other words, you could say that what Aristotle and Thomas do uh, to give two examples, St. Thomas Aquinas, is to say that, that politics always involves an ought, that, that institutions, that uh, the broad civil society, that the political order ought to be aimed 
at what we ought to be as human beings, right? Machiavelli is the figure who you could say is really responsible for a revolution in political thinking. And we sort of think of Machiavelli, he's the guy who said the, the prince or the leader should be, you know, sort of slimy and, uh, you know, try to get away with things. But the real uh, contribution in some ways of Machiavelli that fewer, a lot fewer of us know is that Machiavelli argues that uh, we need to get rid of the ought in politics. Uh, that uh, too, much, um, too much mischief, too much disagreement, and not enough sort of practical thinking has gone into political calculation because people have been concerned with ought. And rather what we need to be concerned with is, is in, in Machiavelli's view. In other words, let's take human beings as they are, as we see them kind of, you could say almost in a state of nature, or as you know, sort of what we see as their sort of, what's their constant condition? And Machiavelli said the constant condition of human beings is that they're self-seeking, they're self-interested, they want to get ahead, they want to put their own interests first, they don't want to advance anything like a common good. They want to advance their own interests. And recognizing that politics needs to be arranged so that that impulse can become productive and, and can be um, shaped or at least uh, harnessed in ways that prevent it from being destructive. And you could say that Machiavelli's understanding is something that kind of informs the American tradition. Right. When we think about the nature of our Constitution, I know you want to talk about the Founding Fathers, so I'll just give you a little foretaste of that. When we think about our Constitution, our Constitution is basically built on the assumption that everyone in politics and everyone in government is trying to get ahead, is trying to advance their own interests. And so you arrange a Constitution so that no one is able to gain particular advantage over anyone else, that you have this, this concept of checks and balances. So it dismisses the idea that politics should be about ought what we ought to be, what is, our, what is the good that we share in common and that we seek and pursue in common, and rather, how do we aggregate all the various interests, you know, often through the model of the market, how do we aggregate our interests to achieve a kind of what, what most people think is, uh, is their preference at any given time. And this is why you can actually have a system that's based upon the idea of aggregation that can nevertheless result in you know, what certainly Aristotle or Thomas would have regarded as a kind of degraded condition. Because it might be that everyone wants you know, to eat Doritos all the time. Which, you know, I like Doritos too, but that would not be what Aristotle and Thomas would call our telos or the good. Uh, that would in fact be a debased condition. So uh, this is all to say that Machiavelli in his own way introduces a kind of revolution in political thinking. And that revolution is so deep and so pervasive that when you ask a very good Catholic student at the University of Notre Dame, what is the common good? They will often give you the answer uh, that Machiavelli <laughs> would have would have offered that the that the common good isn't doesn't involve the ought, but simply the aggregation of what is. All right, thank you. So the next question. All right, so I think that most members of the ASP and, and lots, a large population of Americans appreciate the positive moral cultivation that comes from social institutions, both religious and non-religious, not to mention shared culture and norms of society. Please explain, explain what the philosophers Descartes and Hobbes theorized in relation to this idea and how we experience the effects of that thought. Sure. Um, so just to pick up on exactly what I was just uh, what I was just saying about Machiavelli and Machiavelli's revolution in thinking, among other things, uh, influences, for example, the political thinker Hobbes, the political thinker Hobbes influences the political thinker John Locke, the political thinker John Locke influences the likes of Thomas Jefferson, who adopts um, Locke's thinking in his draft of the Declaration of Independence. So while we're talking about these sort of uh, you know, sort of obscure political philosophers, um, it's nevertheless extremely important to understand that these thinkers are really the lineage of, of the tradition that we now, um, uh, that we now occupy today. Uh, and it's in many ways coming to know the arguments and thoughts of these thinkers is to make, is to make visible for us the deepest assumptions of our own political order. It's, um, 
uh, there's that old there's that old joke about the fish swimming in the fishbowl that can't see the water that they're swimming in. They don't even know what water is. Uh, and in a way, getting to know these thinkers uh, is is in, in some senses to put water food dye or or coloring water coloring into the fishbowl so that suddenly the water can become visible to us. So if Machiavelli is right, there is no common good. There's only the aggregation of our interests and the ability of a political order uh, to harness interest in the pursuit uh, of making it possible for us all to seek our individual ends. Um, then um, the, uh, the idea or ideal of establishing a political order that itself cultivates certain kinds of virtues and that creates a, an atmosphere or creates an ecology for a variety of institutions to cultivate sort of moral excellence and moral virtues. That becomes suspect, right? And especially once we introduce this idea of liberty as being free from other people and other institutions, the idea that there should be institutions that cultivate certain kinds of um, cultivate our capacity to achieve the virtues of our telos, right, to use the Aristotelian phrase, those institutions will become deeply suspect because those now represent an obstacle to my self-fulfillment. And if my self-fulfillment is pursuing my particular interests, what I think are my own particular interests. And so it's not just that you can have a liberal society that's very tolerant of a lot of different institutions and a lot of different um, arenas of cultivation. Ultimately, if we define liberty as freedom from any kind of arbitrary limitation upon my own will and the will, my capacity to do what I want, then those kinds of institutions are going to become, uh, they're, going to, they're going to be delegitimized. They're going to be uh, viewed as illegitimate in the view of the broader liberal order. And so again, we ought not to be surprised that as the liberal order unfolds. It, it, you, you could say it begins several hundred years ago. Uh, it's conceptually created five, six centuries ago, um, but that it has taken a, a substantial amount of time for liberalism to become realized, in fact, as a political order. And I think we are at the point where that is actually the case, to the point where we begin to see the political order's logic emptying out delegitimizing, even frontally attacking institutions of what we might think of moral formation. Everything from uh, um, the, the, um, the voluntary association, the church, um, and of course the family as the, as the cradle of moral formation. So thinkers like uh, Descartes and Hobbes argue that our nature, and this is also to, to anticipate John Locke as well, our nature, what, what is the essence of human beings, is to be freely, uh, is to be free, sovereign, choosing selves. Is to understand ourselves as unencumbered by any external limitation upon our free choice. That's Hobbes's understanding of human beings in the state of nature, for example. Right, the state of nature is not a particularly lovely place in Hobbes's view, but that's our nature. Our nature is, uh, our true nature is to be freed of any constraints that limit our choice. And what liberalism says is that we are going to arrange the political order to make it as great as possible, as much possible, as possible to, to the greatest possible extent for every human being to be freed of any external constraint upon their capacity to be the self-choosing self. And again, you could say this is a, it's a, it's a pincher movement. Classical liberalism, what we call conservatism, argues that you need to have the greatest expansion of the market not only the market itself as an economic uh, uh, venue, and of course that has to expand to the point of infinity, but it has to embrace and encompass everything that we might think of as not a market into its logic, right? So that, uh, for example, students no longer are understood to be some, someone who has to be tutored by the wise. Rather, a university and a school becomes a cafeteria where you choose whatever you want. If you want dessert first, that's, you know, that's what you can choose. You know, in other words, there's a minimization of the kinds of structures of authority uh, that are supposed to guide the choices of, of people who need yet to enter a condition of sort of mat the, the mature condition of the free human being. So Descartes and Hobbes argue 
uh, among others, that uh, the, the, it's the nature of human beings to be these free, sovereign, choosing selves. And the liberal order, in some ways, sets out to create that theoretical human being in reality. Uh, and that's why I think you see this deep contestation today between, you could say, the broader liberal order writ large and the, the shrinking number of people, it seems, who are trying to defend the institutions that they still believe are responsible for the moral formation that orients us toward the common good. Okay, thank you. And it kind of continuation in that, and I didn't really break this down into the way you talk about the three different steps of revolution, uh, of the liberal revolution. And so I didn't uh, define what the other two were. People were going to have to buy your book and read it to make sure they understand all three. <laughs> okay. But um, what I want to say is uh, the third one. So you say the third part of the revolution of thought ushering in modern liberalism was rejecting the older acceptance of human nature to the quest for dominion over human nature. And this comes in both forms. So you have the conservative liberals and the progressive liberals play this out in their own modes. How do you see this rejection take place in the current atmosphere? Sure. So um, uh, one of the basic key, uh, one of the basic um, ar uh, arguments, and I think the, the features of liberalism as I've described it, and it has to be a fa basic feature as I've described it, is, is the following. If liberty, and by the understanding of liberalism, if liberty is freedom from external constraint, that any freedom from an obstacle to our capacity um, uh, and our ability uh, to do as we wish uh, and to be as we wish and to uh, become what we wish, then there really are two main obstacles to, to, this, uh, uh, to this project. And the first we've been talking about, the first of those main objects is sort of obstacles in the human sphere basically the, ob the obstacles of other people. You could say liberalism as a political project uh, manifests itself as the effort to, you know, in some ways construct a pretty massive architecture of both economic and social political forms that seeks to minimize as much as possible uh, and the obstacles that any other human being might place to the actions and choices of our sovereign selves. Uh, you know, one really good example is if, if, if some of the viewers can remember back to President Obama's second political campaign, he had, a, he had an ad campaign that only appeared on, on the internet and then it kind of disappeared. It's like the only thing on the internet that's ever disappeared. Uh, it was called The Life of Julian. Some, some viewers might remember this. And it portrayed the, the life of a young woman, well, actually a woman over the course of her lifespan from, from childhood to, uh, to elder, her, her, her uh, older years. Uh, who was supported by a whole series of government programs that President Obama had helped to create or, or to support. Uh, but essentially what the message of that, of that ad was, was that these government programs allowed this young woman to live a life in which she did not have to rely on any other human being. All she had to do was rely upon the programs of government. And the striking thing about this ad campaign was that there was no other human being in the ad campaign. Right? She was as if, it's as if she lived in in you know, Robinson Crusoe's island or, or Hobbes' state of nature without other people. It was a completely autonomous self, but this autonomous self required this massive architecture of government to achieve that condition. And I think that's really the paradox here. We tend to think of big government being opposed to individualism, but I think that commercial showed us that really individualism can only arise in its truest sense through a kind of massive apparatus of government. Uh, that, that frees us from other people. So that's the first, in some ways, the first project of liberalism. The second, the second main project is that uh, the great obstacle to our freedom is nature. Nature always imposes a kind of limitation on us. It places the ultimate limitation, we're going to die, we're going to you know, we'll become sick at some point, uh, we'll become frail, uh, all the things that, uh, you know, the amount of your gray hair and my gray hair indicate we're experiencing in full. Uh, that, uh, that nature imposes certain limits on us. But of course, we also know that nature imposes all kinds of limits, uh, at least to the extent that nature doesn't always cooperate with our desires. So the classical liberal project, the project of Locke and the project of Francis Bacon, who was um, uh, the, one of the first employers of Thomas Hobbes, in fact. Uh, Thomas Hobbes worked for Francis Bacon. So this is a very tight, tight-knit intellectual <laughs> community in ways. Um, 
was the was the effort to um, redefine science uh, from its original understanding, which was the effort to understand the natural order, to our understanding of science, which is increasingly not only the effort to understand, but to exercise dominion over the natural order, right? To um, uh, to exercise mastery and command uh, using uh, the, the tools that we can learn from the natural order in the form of technology uh, to allow human beings to change, transform, and ultimately master and dominate the natural order. So this is this is uh, this project is born alongside and becomes a deeply a part of the liberal project. You say the kind of scientific technological project. Um, now classical liberalism argues that the nature that needs to be conquered is largely the nature out there the nature of the world. And it's, you know, for this reason, it's largely a kind of economic project. And this is why, of course, you know, any succession of sort of more conservative liberals you can think of uh, want to make the argument that there should be no limit on what we ought to be able to do in and with the natural world. Right? This is the uh, Sarah Palin's old drill baby drill mantra, right? That there should be really no limit placed upon our ability to extract and to use and manipulate the stuff of nature. Because to be free requires us ultimately to do with nature what we want. The progressive liberal tradition, interestingly, argues that there ought to be some limits on that project. Because that project ultimately makes it difficult for us to live uh, human lives uh, in a world that's increasingly uh, scarred, uh, manipulated, damaged, and uh, depleted. Um, but the progressive liberal project embraces the idea of conquering nature when it comes to human nature and human biology in particular, that our biology ought to present no obstacle to the achievement of these independent self-making autonomous selves. And this is why the project, especially uh, involving reproductive technology, involving um, uh, 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 transsexual uh, technology operations and so forth, all of the technology that we think of today um, as uh, imposing limits that um, uh, result from our biology have become very deeply embedded in the progressive liberal project. And here again, I would say that, you know, um, we see, I think we see evidence, accumulating evidence that both of these, both sides of, these, of this liberal project, they both win, they both advance, right? There are very few limits placed upon our manipulation of the natural world. And there are few, very few limits uh, placed upon uh, our ability to manipulate our own nature. In fact, it's funny because we constantly debate whether the Supreme Court today is liberal or conservative. And I would say if you look at the kinds of cases and how it decides cases, it's now deciding cases more or less in line with this liberal project. It more or less, uh, you know, there's, very, there's a great friendliness to sort of corporate interests, which is considered to be conservative, just as there is, of course, an ongoing defense of the idea of the liberal sovereign self in regards to sexuality and identity, right? the, the most recent uh, case on trans, uh, on uh, sexual identity um, and Title uh, Title uh, Nine and Title Seven uh, being the case. So, um, uh, the uh, so in a sense, the the arguably the the most important political institution today is now the most deeply. Uh, sort of most deeply defends this liberal object and aim uh, that is so deeply embedded in, in it seems to me the regime of the of the American of the American experience right advancing both paths of liberalism in the effort to achieve both our freedom from other people and our freedom achieved through the conquest of nature. Well, you did actually answer my next question, but it is another quote that I really enjoyed from your books. I want to. I want to read it, and this is, again, this frames it uh, really quickly. And you can actually answer the first part of this because you didn't quite hit that. And so, uh, well, again, one of my favorite lines, the project of advancing the liberal order takes the superficial form of a battle between seemingly intractable foes, and the energy and acrimony of that contest shrouds a deeper cooperation that ends up advancing liberalism as a whole. So uh, you drove the second part really well, uh, explain how that is happening, but uh, would you want to comment on how it, you know, it seems like we have two sides that are against each other uh, and really play like uh, it play into each other's hands. Yeah. Well, I think maybe this is, this point touches on, uh, I think, especially uh, interest of the American Solidarity Party, 
which is what's interesting is that um, if we think of the, the political left and the political right over the last 50 to 100 years, certainly since post-World War II era, um, as I've been arguing, both of the both sides of the political spectrum have a deep commitment to one aspect of the liberal project. And in the on the political right, it's especially the market and the role that the market plays in freeing us uh, and in, in uh, allowing us to exercise uh, choices as sovereign consumers and individuals. And on the political left, um, it's especially been the you know what we think of as identity project, the the project of of um, limiting any influence of, you know, broadly speaking, uh, the institutions of moral formation, the traditional institutions of church, family, and so forth, transforming educational institutions from one that once were sort of moral, you, know, you could say, broadly speaking, uh, drew from a long tradition of moral formation to ones that seek to liberate us uh, from the limits uh, of, um, especially in the realm of, of sexual identity. Uh, so, so both sides have this liberal project, but it's also true that both sides have a non-liberal side of their, uh, of their uh, uh, self-conception. And so for a long time you had, uh, you know, think back to Ronald Reagan, you had a combination of a strong commitment to free markets and advancing free markets, as well as all of the language and evocation of family values, to traditional values. And it's morning in America, and, uh, the stress upon kind of traditional way of life. Um, and so, you know, you know, I think probably many of your members uh, are, have gravitated to the uh, Solidarity Party because of a deep sense that this, ultimately, this is, a, this is a combination that can't be sustained. You can't have a cowboy economy in which, you know, everything is a wild frontier and hope to maintain the kind of stability and the kind of ethos that's going to support, um, you know, kind of stable communities and stable families. You know, that an economy needs to, in some ways, be oriented to supporting the, the stability necessary for families to flourish, regardless of their income, regardless of their, uh, of, of their whatever degrees they might have and so forth. So there's that tension within the political right. And then there's, there's, a, there's a kind of comparable tension within the political left. The political left has, as I've been saying, it has its liberal agenda. And that liberal agenda has been to free us, especially from the social and even private institutions that might constrain our individual choice. This is why it's becoming increasingly hostile toward religion, increasingly hostile toward the family, obviously seeks to promote the idea of mobility, getting outside of the whatever limited parochial worldview you might come from, the cosmopolitan citizen, uh, the opposition to borders and boundaries, all of this is part of, you could say, the left's liberal project. But the left also understands that there needs to be some kind of a moral constraints upon the economy. This is where, in some ways, you could say the left is not, you know, has a kind of, at least a, a segment of itself that's not, um, uh, that's not completely defined by, by, uh, by a liberal self-understanding. And yet here you see a comparable tension because how is it you can have on the one hand this idea of the sovereign liberated self that really in some ways is, is kind of uh, it, the, the idea of the self-choosing self in realms of identity is really the kind of perfected understanding of the consumer, right? It's the perfected understanding of the person who operates now in a kind of sexual marketplace, defining ourselves regardless of whatever nature seems to have uh, suggested I might be, regardless of whatever circumstance uh, might uh, might have um, bestowed upon me. Um, and so there's a kind of very similar, almost Gnostic hatred of the given that you see animating the political right uh, in its embrace of the free market. So the left and the right, again, seem to be great antagonists, but the side, I think as I've just said, the side uh, on the left and the right that, that tends toward the liberal side and on the political right that has been uh, its embrace of the market and expansion of the market and the expansion not only of the physical marketplace to global status, but the expansion of the market into almost every sphere of life. And on the left, the expansion of the idea of sovereign individual choice in the realm of, uh, of our, uh, sort of our, uh, our, our, how we understand ourselves, our identities and so forth. These are the parts of the agenda that have advanced. Right, on both sides. These have been successful on both sides. Uh, 
And I think in the, over the last 50 years, many of us, you know, or at some point in our lives, probably thought we were deeply committed to one of these sides or the other. Right? And it would tend to be, you know, it would probably tend to be, do I think that we need to limit the expanse of the marketplace, the domination of the marketplace, and then you might trend, you might have trended to the left. Or do we think we need to protect traditional values and protect the family? And then you might have drifted to the right, but probably at some point, if you're in the Solidarity Party, at some point you begin to think, you know what, the way that this party is set up doesn't, it can't work, right? The thing that I really care about can't actually be advanced in this party because this party is really only advancing the, the part of their agenda that conforms to their deepest liberal assumptions, right? Which is gonna be the free market and the identity politics. And so the people I think who probably found their way to the Solidarity Party realize that if you're going to care about either one of those things, uh, the, a kind of moral economy and a moral ecology of, of families, communities, uh, and associations, then you're gonna to have to put these things together. And that means you're gonna to have to really question the deepest liberal assumptions that seem to dominate, not just our political scene, but the deepest assumptions uh, that, that we operate under. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, you put that together in a very profound way. Uh, by the time this video airs, I'll give it my vice presidential speech uh, for whatever that's worth. And I titled it, The Hard Road is Less Traveled. And, and people often ask me, why isn't the American Solidarity, you know, people who joined the party, who found out about it and kind of see what our platform is, why aren't you guys more popular, right? There's lots of people mm -hmm. out there. And my response is, because it's harder than what you just described. The reason that the, the liberal left and liberal right went out over their good ideas is because those are the easy parts, right? Having a free economy, is really easy to push for, really easy to argue for in an empty, vacuous sense. Same thing is true for identity politics. But then when you wanna argue the other part and actually put it into action, I think is probably the bigger thing. And that's gonna lead us really to the end of what your prescriptions are and a kind of, we agree on what those prescriptions are for the solutions. And unfortunately, that's just the thing. Those prescriptions are very, very difficult, right? It's gonna cost people, not even money, but it's just gonna cost you your comfort, right? And I feel like that's where, the liberal left uh, and right, uh, the, the progressives and conservative liberals, or sorry, the, yeah, progressive and conservative liberals, I mean, that's, they advance on those things because those are the easy things. Those are the most basis parts of our nature. Kind of, you talked about, you know, Machiavelli and, and, and going to, well, that's, you know, let people do what they do. Well, that's what they do. They, they do the easy stuff. So um, I think I, the, that sort of continues into this discussion of, uh, and you you brought up the concept of post liberals, but you you mentioned very early on in your book. It might have even been in the preface about the the crit. You got two kinds of crit, uh, critics, right? You get the critiques come from both sides on the book, and so the defenders of liberalism often responded uh, respond and criticize your book by saying, "Well, only liberalism can uphold a pluralistic society and ensure the rights of people of different religions, ethnicities, political persuasions, identities, so forth." And so to them, any alternative to that is what you called a, an authoritarian one, you know, even a tyrannical authoritarian one by definition, okay? But on the other hand, you mentioned that post-liberal critics have suggested it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't present the one single comprehensive moral vision that you can organize politics around. So with that in mind, and, and I'll let you kind of go into what you do, your prescription at the end, of how to uh, come out of this, you know, in that discussion we had about like, putting two things, the two hard things together, uh, but still living in a pluralistic society. Yeah. Well, so typically when I when when I think about the the two the, the, the kind of two critics I get, it's actually um, as you would expect, it's critics, uh, liberals on the left and the right. Uh, who really hate one part of my book. It just turns out they're the opposite parts of my book. So progressive liberals really hate the part of my book where I uh, am critical of, obviously, progressive liberal emphasis upon lifestyle liberalism and, and autonomy. Uh, but they like the part of my book where I'm critical of the liberal economy and, and then vice versa. The classical liberals are deeply critical of, um, of my critiques of the marketization of life um, but uh, but they like the parts where I'm critical of progressive liberalism, and I and I in some ways I, I take comfort in the fact that I'm constantly attacked. You know, depending on the day of the week, I'm constantly attacked by people 
on the left and people on the right. There was just a column that appeared in the Washington Post of George Will attacking me for being un-American, uh, that my, my position and my arguments uh, were contrary to uh, the American order. Uh, and I post, recently posted a repost uh, to, to George Will on that, on that point. Um, so that's typically, the, that's typically the critique, but you're right that um, the critique is in some ways is the same, which is the critique that this somehow is not American, it's authoritarian, um, it seeks to impose some kind of authoritarian uniformity upon a large nation made up of many different parts um, that it's impracticable and so forth. Now, I guess the first, the first response to that, just in general, is to note uh, that um, if, in case someone hasn't been paying attention to the news, liberalism is in a profoundly authoritarian order. Uh, in fact, it has to be. In order to liberate people from the particular circumstances that they happen to be born into, uh, the families they're born into, the traditions they're born into, the religion that they're born into, Ultimately, especially to crack open those last set of institutions and the family being the most elemental of those, liberalism is going to become, as we're seeing, it's going to become very authoritarian in the name of liberation. And again, this is the irony uh, that, uh, that we tend not to see, that the claim to be on the side of freedom means that you have to, you have to eradicate anything, any existing institution that you deem not to be sufficiently liberated. You have to either transform it from within or ultimately attack it directly head on through the powers of the state. And that's what we're seeing increasingly in a liberal society. So anyone who thinks that we are simultaneously the most free people ever, right? We're simultaneously terribly free. Uh, we can do and be almost anything we want. And yet increasingly feeling as if, you know, both the public and the private corporate order is encroaching in every aspect of our lives. These two things are not contradictory. They actually go together. So I think the claim that somehow we can have this authority-free society uh, is itself flawed. There's going to be authority, and the question is going to be in toward what end and in what institutions will authority be vested? Um, and personally, I would rather have authority vested widely, scattered widely, not located in one central government, and authority especially located in institutions like churches and local communities rather than a very powerful and heavily armed central government. But the divide I think you're talking about is, um, or at least a critique, is I have the critiques who are arguing that, um, you know, I'm not an American and I'm an authoritarian. And in some ways, the uh, critique for, of people who, who argue that I'm not offering enough of an alternative, uh, and especially that I didn't offer a sort of full-blown schema or blueprint for what, uh, what a sort of post-liberal future should look like. And, and I, I guess that, you know, I, I think we'll probably, you want to probably talk a little bit more about sort of what's next, but uh, I guess I would just want to say that um, uh, the, the idea that one should come up with a blueprint for politics, I think is born of a deeply liberal ideological standpoint. In other words, it's part of a modernist political project to say, we need to have the imprint and the blueprint and the plan that we can once we get rid of this system, we can impose it on the next system uh, and just roll it out and boom, we will have an entirely new political order. I think that's, you know, politics doesn't work that way and it ought not to be attempted to work that way because that's of course always the prescription uh, for violence. Uh, some of the violence we're seeing right now, the effort to you know, eradicate an existing political system and impose a new political system. Um, and it's also simply false. That's not how human beings operate. We tend to operate through a kind of accumulation and accretion of, let's say, institutions and practices and ways of living that conform to an idea of who we are, but that will take time. And it's a much more Burkean understanding of politics. In other words, if you have an understanding of what politics is and what the human person is, you will develop the kinds of institutions and the kinds of practices that will move you in that direction. I think that's really the better way to think about how it is we propose to move forward is not through a radical revolutionary transformation. It does involve a kind of tr transformative understanding of how we think of human beings, what our anthropology is, how we conceive of the ends and purposes of human life and the place of politics in that, uh, in that project. Um, but then once you do that, then it's going to, I think as a kind of natural consequence of where you think you're going 
you're going to take the steps. You're not going to go from point A to Z. You're going to go from point A to B and B to C. In other words, you're going to take the concrete steps that will bring you closer to that goal, but don't imagine you can do that with a single sort of Superman uh, leap and bound. So the first thing to do is to get our anthropology right. Who are we as human beings? Uh, and of course we should propose policies. Of course we should think about what are the policies that would make an economy more supportive of family formation and family sustenance. Um, but we also need to be a kind, we need to have a certain amount of patience uh, for how, how sort of human life and politics proceeds and unfolds. And we should abandon the more revolutionary tenor that I think modern politics has introduced into the world. Yes, I mean, a very, very outstanding answer to that question. And I think uh, one of the things I talk about in, in my speech uh, is uh, my understanding of, and my changing of my understanding of my own parents and how they came to this country as immigrants in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, as a child and kind of growing up, they would always talk about starting with nothing, right? And it was uh, this, this concept of how they came with almost nothing. My dad came and he studied at Youngstown, Ohio, got his master's, and he slept in a studio apartment with like six other students, graduate students, and just to save every dime they had because they had almost nothing. And he, he was being sponsored by a, a local family. So, you know, I hear this story. We grew up in small, you know, ratty apartments. My mom said I ate bugs off the floor. Um, and so growing up, I, I kind of respected that starting with nothing and building up from scratch attitude that my parents had. And then, uh, you know, I looked through my own success and I had this kind of understanding of this meritocracy, you know, like that I did it, right? Like I did my, I'm my own man, right, as an individual. And only recently have I come to understand that they didn't start with nothing. They actually started with everything that was important, right? They started with the moral capital, a, 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 just a vast moral wealth uh, built up on what you were saying of generations of people understanding and building culture and building notions of, of um, what ought to be, right? What the duties were, you know, to each other as a, as a couple, but to their distant families and to the community that they would form, you know, in, in the United States. And then to my brother and I, you know, as we were growing up. Uh, and I think that that's kind of goes to what you're saying is what that next step is, is to always think, how do I keep building moral capital? We're just so, um, at least on the political right, right? It's all about um, wealth capital. And, and I think we forget that there's just so much of that depth that is passed on from generation to generation. So the last thing that um, I want to touch base on, and again, you know, we, we sometimes in the Solidarity Party uh, get some flack for associating ourselves with traditional Christian democracy. And to me, uh, I wrote an article recently about this, but Christian democracy really uh, can have a universal appeal because it doesn't require faith in any particular Christian church or in Christ himself, but the story of the cross, the passion, and, and the crucifixion, uh, and why, right? Like that understanding of like, there's a sacrifice and a suffering required for a good to come about. And I think people in the West, you know, we joke about um, ideas like there's without pain, no pain, no gain, right? You kind of hear that. So will the reconstruction of our culture, you know, really require this extreme sacrifice? Is, is it just something that people who really want to you know get to the to the bottom of everything like sorry to get to this next level i mean is that just something that's going to have to happen yeah so um you know it's funny to me that one should have to defend uh the idea and ideals of christian democracy today uh i guess it's funny but it's also really sad um there seems to be a kind of historical amnesia that has completely forgotten that until the advent of Christianity, the idea that every human being was endowed with an inherent dignity that deserved respect and that deserved uh, you know, respect in both theological but also social and political terms, this was unknown to the world. Right? There were, you know, the world was defined as basically uh, you know, masters and slaves uh, in uh, um, in many ways. Uh, I think Philip, there were philosophers uh, who understood differently, uh, but I think as a practical matter in how human beings dealt with each other, there were 
there were sort of people who were considered to be um, you know, acceptable and people who were not. So the idea of Christian democracy, I would say it's redundant. <laughs> it's a redundancy. Uh, in other words, uh, it's really about the idea, and I hear I'm being Chestertonian, but, uh, but uh, you, in some ways, um, the concept of democracy is impossible without without the advent of Christianity, that everyone, right, the incarnation teaches us that every human being, right, is um, in some senses an heir and inheritor of, uh, of Christ's incarnation, that we are, uh, we are um, uh, ultimately destined to, um, to a condition that, that transcends the mere humanness uh, and the mere frailty that, that, we, all, that we all share. So um, in, with that understanding then, uh, it seems to me that what we've, everything we've been talking about today, uh, it really points to how do you arrange, how do you institute both politically, but also socially, culturally, uh, institutions that make it possible for everyone to lead a flourishing life. And I think it's really important to say to lead a flourishing life regardless of your economic um, condition. Right? So this is a, an important point that I think there's a theory, I think especially in progressive liberalism, that once everyone has equal economic condition, we will all achieve a satisfactory life. And I think this, you know, this was, of course, the vision of, of Karl Marx. It was a foolish vision. Right? It's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's just as foolish as the idea that if you have a lot of money, you can lead a flourishing life. I think really what we need to, we really need to understand, what are the conditions that allow us to have a flourishing life? And if certainly those involve a certain amount of economic um, you know, largesse and a certain amount of economic uh, support. But then there's gonna be the kinds of things that you're describing. What are the social, what's the social ecology that's going to make it possible for working men and women uh, to, to, to be able to raise children in a world in which they don't fear allowing their children to leave their homes? Right. And I think as, as a, now a parent of young adults, uh, I was, I was raised at a time when you could confidently, when I was a child, you could confidently allow your child to go outside of your house and play with friends and be in the neighborhood, not just because it was a safe place, but because it was safer in a deeper sense, because you knew that what you would be encountering in the world would be supportive of what the parents were trying to do in the home. I think we increasingly live in the world where if you care really deeply about the moral formation of your child, you're really worried about letting your child go out into the world in which they might encounter the sort of cesspool of pornography everywhere you turn, the kind of degradation of violence on every screen. I mean, even just to have in their pocket those screens uh, undermines everything that one might want to do to raise a certain kind of a child, to raise the next generation. So what is the kind of ecology that we need to foster and create that makes it possible for people to be confident in the neighborhoods and in the communities in which they live? And I think this is, this is precisely the aim of a Christian democratic, or I think of, of a solidarity party, which is precisely that ideal of uh, that um, neither the market nor the government can supply the essential goods, right? The greatest and deepest goods uh, of what we need and require as human beings. They are essential. I'm not anti-government and I'm not anti-market. I'm actually pro both. I think anyone in the solidarity party needs to be pro-government, when it's doing its job correctly and pro-market when it's appropriately right, placed and centered. Uh, but it also understands that government and markets can be destructive of that ecology that's supportive of, the, of human flourishing, of a true democracy, uh, or it can be supportive of those, of those goods and those, and those ends. So I, I, I think ultimately uh, the, um, the aim and purpose is in many ways to um, uh, reorient both um, you know, in the public sphere and in the, the sort of market sphere, the government and the market, uh, to promote an ecology, right, a broader social ecology and a broader social fabric that will make it possible for us to be free in that, in that I think, ennobled and classical sense of being a self-governing people, of being people who are capable of developing the kinds of virtues in which we can rely upon each other, upon our neighborhoods, uh, and can flourish regardless of our economic status the name of the school and our degree, uh, the you know the kind of uh, the kind of life prospects that we might have uh, economically or geographically. That this is the kind of equality we should aim for. All right, Professor, I really appreciate this whole dialogue. Uh, I'm going to put this up on the on YouTube, and people who have been viewing this know that Professor Deneen will be back 
in uh, on Saturday evening, the exact time I will post on the convention website for question and answer period. So uh, you will have your chance to put forth some questions and the professor will do his best to respond. But thank you again, and we'll see you later. My pleasure, thank you.